My judgment says we're not at peak volatility. Uh, my judgment says there's too much uncertainty in the marketplace. The confluence of the number of shocks to the system to me is unprecedented. If inflation has failed to moderate, then a faster rate of rate, rate increases could be necessary. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition on Friday, the 3rd of June. I'm Danny Berger in London. In for Francine Lacroix, here's what's coming up on today's program. No time for a breather. The Fed's Leo Brainard says there's no case for pausing rate hikes in September. Stocks climb before today's key U.S. job report. Layoff at Tesla. Just two days after Elon Musk declares an end to working at home, a report states that the CEO plans to cut staff at the car maker by 10%. Plus, 100 days of war. European leaders approve a sixth round of Russian sanctions as fighting in eastern Ukraine rages on. We're going to bring you a special 30 minutes of programming on Ukraine at 9.30 a.m. So we're about an hour into cash equity trading here in Europe. Not a lot of conviction behind these markets. The U.K. is closed, of course, for another day for the Queen's Jubilee. Also, Hong Kong, China, those closed as well. So just in general, volumes have been lighter today. European stocks, they are pointing upwards. A little bit of catch-up, perhaps, with the rally in the U.S. Yesterday, of course, it's all about jobs. Some weaker ADP numbers yesterday, which are typically a poor indicator for what jobs will do today and non-farm payrolls. But that bad news translating to good news for equities, anything that stops the Fed from being aggressive. Your German bond, that 10-year that yield, not a lot of movement there. Brent crude, that is lower for a second day, 1.2% uh, lower. In fact, 116. Uh, I should say it is lower for the first day. We had a rally after OPEC decided to increase their output by about 50% based on prior months. Uh, the market, not very impressed. Your euro dollar, a bit stronger this morning. More bets for rate hikes, 50%, which would be historic in December. Now, let's get your check on Tesla pre-market because Tesla report by Reuters saying that they are pausing hiring and Musk also saying they need to cut staff by 10 percent. Immediate reaction that gut punch is a lower by 2.5 percent at Tesla. Of course in this report from Reuters they cited Musk saying that he has a quote super not good feeling about the economy hence his desire to freeze hiring cut staff by 10 percent and we certainly have seen other corporations specifically tech also try to freeze is hiring. So what does that mean for this corporate uh, economy as we get today's uh, payrolls number? Here's the view in Europe. Of course, just ignore the UK here. Pretend that doesn't exist. London, of course, closed. It's mostly green. But again, I go back to this. Not a lot of conviction behind today's moves with volume lighter than usual. Also getting such a big data point today uh, in terms uh, of the jobs number, what that means for the Fed surely might dictate the pace of market moves as well. So that being said, um, you know, it might be just sort of a wait and see approach uh, of what happens there. So CAC 40, uh, that's up about two tenths of a percent, similar to the DAX as well. Of course, we also have some euro area numbers coming in as well. May services that hit at 56.1. The expectation was for 56 and a half. So that is an ever so slight miss. But of course, uh, we're looking for the shift for to services away from goods. So perhaps services coming in a bit weaker isn't the most promising of signals. So that's the European data. We also get some major U.S. data later today. As I've been saying, U.S. Labor Department sent to release its latest monthly jobs report on Friday. The ADP data yesterday, that showed U.S. companies adding 128,000 positions last month. That's the fewest since the pandemic recovery began. Here's what some of our guests on Bloomberg TV had to say about it. The U.S. economy uh, is going into the recession or, or growth is coming down. Tomorrow's payroll report will tell us whether we're seeing that in the labor market now with, with employment. I think that we will see substantial signs of slowing. There was a lot of different things going on now. And again, it's just going to be that data dependent. We're going to have to build that. And it does allow us to anchor to this new normal. The pace of job growth is slowing. Uh, so if there's uh, uh, odds of upside or downside to our estimate, I think uh, there could be some downside. If we do see, you know, the risk of a recession climb higher, so overall, I think investors should, uh, you know, put on their seatbelts and brace themselves for more volatility ahead. 
Let's add another smart voice to this mix. It's Peter Garnery, Saxo Bank Head of Equity and Quant Strategy. Peter, great to have you on the program. So like magic, ahead of this jobs number, we get this news from Elon Musk from Tesla. Reuters report that they're going to freeze hiring, perhaps cut more. But of course, they're not the first company to do this. Can you give us a sense in corporate America of the concern, the hesitation among corporate, specifically tech, to add on to start to hire new people? Well, I think uh, Tesla is part of a trend that a lot of technology companies in, in Silicon Valley and more broadly as well has read the memo from Sequoia Capital and Benchmark Capital that is putting out these presentations and basically arguing for companies to uh, cut, cut down on cost, especially very quickly on, on marketing potentials or R&D to lift profitability. This market is not rewarding uh, high revenue costs, uh, sorry, high revenue growth at all, uh, at all costs. Um, you're being rewarded from improvements in return on investor capital and free cash flow generation. So I think it's, it's very prudent, actually, by, by Tesla to, uh, to reduce uh, the staff. I don't put too much emphasis. I don't have very high regards for Elon Musk's uh, ability to predict anything. I, don't, I think this environment, hmm. everything is very difficult. We, the economy, arguably, if you look at the coincident indicators, is still very strong, uh, but it's weakening. Uh, to what extent we'll have a, a recession and will it be mild or, or a tough one? We'll have to see, but it, it's a very uncertain environment, and, and cost cutting is essential. And I think it's one of the reasons why you saw the the guidance uh, cut or outlook cut from uh, from Snap. I think there's a real real weakness coming through in the in the online advertising space as well. Peter, you know, in one regard, you could look at Elon Musk, the rest of them, Twitter, Netflix freezing, stopping hiring, and say. As you do, it's a good thing they need to cut costs. But is there not part of you that would want to stray away from these companies because it signals hard times ahead? Well, I, I think there are hard times uh, are coming. Um, our essential thesis is that the world has hit a physical limit. We see difficulties in the world to expand the supply side of our, econ uh, our economy. It will take quite a, a while to do that, it, it very much mimics what we saw in the 1970s. And as long as you have a galloping energy and food crisis, and the energy crisis is getting worse, the food crisis, unfortunately, you can see that in planting and crop season this year, will get, unfortunately, a, a lot worse next year. So as long as the, those two factors are in play, uh, things will get worse. You have China also trying to reopen their economy. Mm. Uh, I think it's a big open question whether that will add to inflation or actually uh, in ease inflation. I'm leaning a little bit towards that. It will actually... Uh, do uh, worse things for inflation. And with the current financial conditions and the trajectory of that and the financial pressures, yeah. if you look at equity fundamentals and valuations, they should come down from current levels. Yeah, you say they're still expensive. Peter, are we yet rid of that Pavlovian uh, dip buying attitude we've seen? Um, well, it's quite normal in bear markets to have 5% and even 10% rebounds. Um, we didn't quite on the close get to a 20% decline in the S&P 500. I think we will get there. As we have said before, the past 12 years is not a really good sequence of events to build your, uh, your decision making right now. I think the combination of high tech valuations and the limits we have hit in the physical world mimics what we saw post the dot-com and in the 1970s. If you look at those drawdowns, they were very lengthy because of high in imbalances in the economy and in on valuations. So we think we're in for the long run. We could go to 30 or minus, uh, sorry, 30 or 35 percent drawdown, and it could take up to a year from now. And if you look at the 70s, in the 1973 wow. drawdown, the economy was strong for an entire year into the drawdown before it suddenly uh, succumbed to the inflationary pressures. And we could see a sort of replay of that uh, again. Peter, 35 percent drawdown. Where do I hide in the meantime? Well, you need, to, you need to figure out how to get the right components for, for this environment. We, we are still arguing for commodities, uh, you know, metals, agriculture, and energy. Cybersecurity, we still like as a story. Uh, semiconductors, um, defense companies, I know it's not very ESG, but it's, uh, it, you know, just look at Rheinmetall and the, the figures that are coming out. They're expecting more than 20% growth rates for the coming years. Well, Peter, you say you like cybersecurity, but that's... Yeah. Cybersecurity are one of the things that's gotten crushed. Yeah. I know that's one of the themes that you like. How can you be sure that that can recover, that that can gain steam as everything else around it is selling off? 
you're absolutely correct. Uh, we still like it. It has not performed as we as we thought it would. Uh, it is being dragged into the overall decline in the technology industry. The thing we, we like about the cybersecurity is that it has a high growth outlook combined with being a necessity, almost like Microsoft operating system for running your business today. The same goes for cybersecurity. And you just saw CrowdStrike the other day. The, the growth rate and I think the ability for these companies to drastically improve their profitability by cutting down on, on marketing and R&D in, in some cases will drastically change the outlook for these companies. And we remain very positive. And the setback we have seen in cybersecurity, I think, is a buying opportunity. This is a multi-decade uh, theme that is going to be super interesting to watch. Peter, going to have to get some more calls from you, so stick around. Peter Garner, Saxo Bank Head of Equity and Quant Strategy. Coming up, as OPEC Plus agrees to open its taps faster over the summer, we're going to get the latest on the direction for oil. All of that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Oil is headed for its sixth weekly gain. That's after a closely watched OPEC Plus meeting delivered only a meager increase in output. But in a nod to the U.S., while of course keeping Russia close, the group agreed with Saudi Arabia to hike production by 0.4 percent of global demand in July and August. Anthony DiPaola, our Middle East energy markets reporter, joins us now. Um, Anthony, I guess, okay, so a 50 percent increase based on prior months. Can they even pump that much out? Can they even live up to that promise? Yeah, uh, no, the answer is uh, to that. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about a 50% increase in what they'd been uh, producing previously, but what we're hearing from analysts is that they'll be pumping actually into the market only about 50% of what they've pledged. So just to break that down, they've been adding 432,000 barrels a day uh, each month into the market as they unwind those cuts that were implemented to uh, battle the market meltdown during COVID. Uh, what they're doing is they're taking uh, the September increase and they're bringing that forward and splitting it over July and August. So they're adding roughly 200,000 barrels a day uh, in July and August on top of that 432. But a lot of the OPEC plus countries are having uh, problems uh, bringing up production. They're having problems meeting those quotas already. So OPEC has really only been producing about half the amount of additional oil they said they'd bring back each month. So a lot of analysts are telling us uh, 300,000, 350 is maybe what's going to come back. Already the market was unimpressed with the additional um, pledge uh, of production that came out yesterday. Uh, oil prices rose yesterday. Um, and with the fact that, that they won't even be producing that much, that's unlikely to really ease things up in the oil markets too much, Danny. Anthony, how does the EU approving a partial ban of Russian oil complicate the picture? Yeah, that's an additional factor that's going to come on it because that's going to take uh, barrels off the market. Uh, of course, Russia is the second biggest member of, of OPEC plus Russia and Saudi Arabia, roughly equal on crude oil, actually. Uh, but if Russia is losing production, that's going to impact, again, how much uh, OPEC plus brings to the market. As Europe deprives Russia of markets for its crude, uh, that might lead Russia to have to shut in some production and, and take those barrels off the market. It's a complicated picture because we've got uh, inflation and uh, cost increases everywhere. We've got uh, China coming back from some of those lockdowns. Uh, even today, we're seeing oil lose a bit of that steam uh, because of some, some not so positive PMI numbers coming out of Italy, France, and Germany. Uh, so that, again, clouds the picture for, for economic growth there. So we've got a lot of factors coming in. Uh, one thing that's looking sure, though, is that OPEC Plus is going to be lagging uh, the market demand going forward over the next couple of months and in, probably into next year, right. Danny. Anthony, thanks so much. Anthony DiPaolo, who's been on top of this story for us all morning, our Middle East energy markets reporter. Peter Garner, Saxo Bank head of equity and quant strategy, is still with us. Peter, moments ago you were saying that you still like commodities uh, as a potential port in the storm. I'm looking at energy in the U.S. and the S&P 500 up nearly 60 percent year to date as everything else has gotten clobbered. Does this trade really have further to run? 
Yes, it has more legs to go. Um, it was our big theme for Q1, and it, it continues to be so. The world goes around with energy. The whole world economy, our society, is one big energy system, and you can't grow wealth and, and, and GDP by not expanding energy. And right now, we have an energy crisis, and, and that's the worry. I think prices will continue to go higher. The sanction against Russia will curb production and, and cut it, actually, in Russia. You have China coming back, so that's adding on the demand side. Um, I know, I mean, oil and gas companies are not particular ESG, so those with very strong ESG mandates and constraints will be left on the sideline here. But um, the cash flow generation and the valuation is just is too good to not uh, be part of it. I mean, energy companies on a relative basis are some of the, the most cheap as they have been in, in 25 years. So we all for it. And if you look at the capital expenditures, these oil and gas majors, they're not investing because of a lot of things. One of them is ESG, but also uncertainty around demand pictures. So as long as the investments are not coming back, prices will continue to go higher and make things worse also for the economy, unfortunately. The, the oil prices, energy stocks, those rallying, of course, has contributed to value outperforming. We see people like Cliff Asnes, for example, at AQR taking a victory lap saying, hey, Kathy Wood, you were wrong in terms of your ARC strategy. Are we about to enter a period where ARC, these types of growthy, momentum-y strategies are about to look more like value for the past decade, i.e. they just stop working? Well, you have to recognize, of course, that when Cliff Asnes talks about value, he, he, he's capturing that risk premium uh, through a long, short uh, expression and also neutral on different industries. So uh, I think that spread will continue to come down. I think that part of the value will continue to do quite well because increased uncertainty in the world and a higher discount rate will favor those that have the value characteristics where you have low valuation and a lot of cash flow coming in the next couple of years, those have a less sensitivity to those dynamics we see where the you know, high growth, very high valued companies are, are more exposed. So I think that spread will come down. If you look at it from a long only perspective, you have to look at the two, uh, the two characteristics. So if you look at the value space, you have a lot of financials. We don't think financials structurally is a very interesting um, industry, especially not here in Europe. Energy is much more interesting. So there you'll get something also of mm. materials, especially driven by the mining companies. If you look at the growth components, there are a lot of very, very interesting business models, but it's all about, it's, that's all about the markets, right? The value you have on a company right. is basically discounting expectations for the future. So will they do better or worse? That's basically the question you have to ask yourself. Yeah, Peter, I mean, I love this. It's not as simple as buy value, sell growth, a lot more complication to it. Peter, great to have you on. Peter Gardner, he's Saxo Bank Head of Equity and Quant Strategy. Coming up, layoffs at Tesla just two days after Elon Musk declares an end to working at home. A report states that the CEO plans to cut staff by about 10%. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Tesla CEO Elon Musk says the electric car maker needs to cut staff by around 10 percent, noting he had a, quote, super bad feeling about the economy. That according to an intern email seen by Reuters. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Auto Industry editor Elizabeth Berman. Elizabeth, 10 percent. What do we know about this? And is it just all about Elon Musk's super bad feeling about the economy? Yeah, it's a super short sentence, but there's been a super quick reaction to it. As you can see, it takes stocks are, are slightly off um, as a result of this. And obviously, this is spreading a lot of worry about how much further the route and particularly tech stocks um, and generally uh, mark the market might have to go. Uh, particularly in the car sector, so far, demand has been far outrunning supply because of the manifold supply chain problems the sector has been experiencing. So for the electric car leader to be really worried about the economy, that's a really bad sign. Uh, it, it certainly is. I mean, and, and as you say, this this extends beyond car makers. This extends um, into tech as well. But Elizabeth, is it all just about the economy or is there any sort of element of pressure to cut costs in this environment? Well, vehicle, well, vehicle making input costs have 
certainly been rising just uh, in, in tandem with everything else. So the pressure is certainly on to reduce costs. So for car makers in particular, and Tesla is no exception here, um, they've also been able to charge higher prices. So what we have been seeing with, uh, with the likes of Mercedes, with the likes of BMW, they've been making fewer mm. cars than they wanted to. But actually, their margins and their profits uh, were, have been very, very strong. Elizabeth, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Elizabeth Berman. And as we've been talking, Tesla continues to drift lower, down by about 2.8% in the pre-market trading. Now, we already saw Nasdaq futures turn negative, but this perhaps impacting them even more. Nasdaq futures down by about half percent. We did see the Nasdaq have a pretty healthy rally yesterday, about 2.8%. Even ARC was rallying yesterday against some optimism uh, when it comes to the Fed perhaps not taking action ahead of Jobs Day. Coming up, 100 days of war, European leaders approve a sixth round of Russian sanctions. Fighting in eastern Ukraine rages on. We're going to bring you a special 30-minute programming on the war in Ukraine and what's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition for a special half hour dedicated to the war in Ukraine. Here are your headlines. Day 100, Russia looks to consolidate recent gains in Ukraine's eastern regions. The EU approves new sanctions after finally overcoming Hungarian objections on oil. Some 1,000 companies have cut ties with Russia since Putin launched his attack in February. We'll examine the consequences. Plus, global food prices stay near record highs. We'll analyze the impact on agriculture as the war fuels shortages and inflation. Well, it's been 100 days since Ukraine invaded, or since Ukraine was invaded by Russia. And over the next half hour, we're not only going to explore the human cost of the world, but also the implications for the wider world. We're going to get the latest on the military situation and how this feeds into relations between Russia and Europe, the U.S., and others. The EU has finally overcome Hungary's objections to approve the box six package of sanctions against, against Moscow, just as President Zelensky warned Russian forces now occupy about 20 percent of Ukraine's territory. Now, at the same time, NATO's secretary general has warned that Ukraine may face a long war of attrition with Russia. After meeting with U.S. President Joe Biden at the White House, Jens Stoltenberg said it was difficult to predict how or when the conflict will end. Wars are by nature unpredictable uh, and uh, uh, therefore uh, we just have to be prepared for the long haul uh, because what we see is that uh, this war has now become a war of attrition uh, where the Ukrainians are paying a high price uh, for uh, defending their own country on the battlefield. Let's get to our reporters to take stock of where we are on this war, how we got here, and where we're heading. Piotr Skolomowski joins us from Warsaw, and Maria Tadeo is in Brussels. Piotr, let's start with you. So 100 days into this war, for some, this is much longer than they had predicted. Do we have any clear indication of where this is going? Who seems to have the upper hand and how long this will go on for? Indeed. So the war started obviously with Russia assuming or betting that it will it will be a blitzkrieg war. Essentially, they will they will come in, uh, knock out uh, the leadership uh, sheep of uh, of Ukraine and and capture the country. It didn't happen as we know, and essentially the the beginning of the war uh, when when the, the assumption was the the response from the West was also quite quick that that Ukraine has the upper hand. Now, what we are in is seems to be sort of a second stage of the war. And, and this is um, a difficult and different situation. So what we're seeing from Russia is that they regrouped. Um, they are obviously scaled down their, their ambitions. And they are now focused on trying to capture the, the eastern part of the, of the country, which is Luhansk and Donetsk regions, which are obviously also the regions where Ukraine has been fighting um, a lot of um, uh, Moscow-backed uh, separatists since 2014. So their position for Russia is obviously stronger. And as we've heard from Jens Stoltenberg, 
it, the nature of the war has changed. It's, as he said, mm. um, it's, it's a war of attrition. And here the Russians have the upper hand in the sense that they have this artillery superiority and they are pounding Ukrainian positions. And the help from the West when it comes to weapons right. is, is really, really yeah. urgent. Well, to that point, Maria, Piotr mentions that the response from the West was swift, and along with being swift, it was also united. That unity and response from Europe, from the UK, is it still intact today? Uh, Danny, it, it, you know, this is, if you go back, and I think at times you really need to get some perspective here. Uh, if you look at the situation three months ago, we were debating whether or not Germany was going to certify the Nord Stream 2. The reality is, on the ground now, the European Union has approved uh, six different packages of sanctions. Uh, we've now gone from uh, banning coal to essentially a partial ban on oil, potentially reducing uh, purchases from uh, Russian oil imports by 90 percent at the end of the year. So clearly that is move uh, in the right direction uh, to show the unity of the European Union. But what is clear now is that the more you sanction, the more you feel the second round effects of the war, the more difficult it's going to be to maintain that united front. I don't think that's a secret. And that is essentially what I heard in many of my conversations behind the scenes on Monday and Tuesday when European leaders met here. Now, politically, we have seen that when it comes to defense and diplomacy and NATO, yes, it has strengthen uh, that unity. We talked about a NATO that was brain dead just two years ago. That was the description of uh, President Emmanuel Macron, that it didn't really serve a purpose. Right now, we're seeing a NATO that shows we are going to strengthen our eastern flank. What we're seeing right now is Russia by force trying to change and redefine uh, eastern borders, and therefore uh, NATO has to be stronger and more united than ever, potentially with two new members. But I think specifically, Danny, when you look to Ukraine and this unity, but also the speed of the help. The issue here mm. is that for many European countries, they need a transition, but the Ukrainians don't have time. They want it now. And that is constantly right. the perennial point of tension between the two of them. Right, and they want it now, and they also want weapons. And Piotr, we have seen President Biden be more willing, saying he's going to send those long-range missiles. Can the U.S., Europe, can they provide enough resources to Ukraine um, to take the initiative in this battle? Well, obviously, as you, as you pointed out, it, it was actually quite interesting what Biden has done because it, it's been an about face. Initially, he was against sending those artillery uh, systems that have a range of 50 uh, miles. Uh, and he was worried that basically Ukraine will use this artillery, artillery to, to shoot across the, the Russian uh, border. And, you know, a few, few, few days later, this has changed, and, and he approved the, 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 the that, and then the system um, will mm. be sent. So, obviously, th this is important. And, and, and as Maria said, um, Ukraine keeps pushing for more, uh, more weapons to be sent. And that's crucial, yes. because at this point, what yeah. we're seeing is Russia is pounding the, the, the positions that Ukraine so have. They don't have the alternative to respond. Yeah. And obviously yeah. getting this uh, artillery to or, or those systems to the position that Ukraine have is, is also very difficult logistically. Yeah, Piotr, I'm just going to jump in here because, Maria, I, I just want to wrap things up with you in terms of where we go from here with Europe, not just with energy and commodities, um, but also at the same time prospects for expanding NATO. You touched on this a little bit quickly. Just wrap up the thought. Yeah, you know, I think commodities is part of it, but the fundamental, the core question here is when you look at this victory of Ukraine, everyone says Ukraine has to win this war, but what does it actually entail? What does it mean? When you talk to different European officials, to me, it is not clear they have a, a simple definition for this. And the objectives of a victory, I think, really change depending on the countries. It's not the same to ask a German than a Baltic uh, country. The other big issue, Danny, and this is going to become a heated debate, is what to do with Ukraine in the European Union. We know that the Ukrainians are pushing very hard to get the candidacy status in about three weeks' time for the European Union, however, this is a very tricky, heated question. And for the time being, there is no consensus as to whether or not that status would be granted to Ukraine, which for them, of course, for mm. their morale in the midst of a war, would be very detrimental not to get it. Maria P Piotr, thank you very much. That's Bloomberg's Piotr Skolomowski in Warsaw and Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Coming up, hundreds of corporations have cut ties with Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. We'll look at the fallout next. This is Bloomberg.
I would say to all my fellow chief executives and chairmen around the world and major shareholders, if you're making a dollar from Russia right now, I'd call it blood money. We've seen the president with Crimea and the invasion there, and we feel that Russia might become uh, an area where we'd better be cautious. We stopped, obviously, all financing investments, uh, but there are a lot of counterparties that are sanctioned, so not easy to make a deal in terms of, uh, of uh, further reduction. We have taken the decision to uh, develop the secondary sources to be able to, at a later stage, uh, potentially be independent from Russian titanium. Now we are going to uh, exit Russia. Uh, we need to compensate that, uh, but we have a, a very good plan in sale 27. It's not something that you can just shut the, the shop and then walk out. I mean, so we are in the process of, of course, stopping investments, so there's no more growth possible in the country at this point. We advocate, and others are advocating a full embargo on natural gas as well, but it will probably takes some time. Business executives there on cutting ties with Russia. And on that corporate story, almost a thousand companies have curtailed operations in Russia since it invaded Ukraine. That, according to a recent study by Yale. Apple, Disney, McDonald's, ExxonMobil, the list just goes on and on. And now the German insurance giant Allianz has agreed to sell a majority stake in its Russian operations to Interholding, the owner of Zeta Insurance, for an undisclosed price. We are joined now by Ben Butter, CEO of Euro Chambre, which represents more than 200 million businesses in Europe through a network of associations. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. So we get more companies uh, joining, pulling out. It's not over yet. But what is the state of confusion and unknowingness as companies look to make this exit? Thanks. Yeah, well, the state of confusion is, is high. Um, a lot of uh, variables are, are moving around. Um, the Russian parliament, the Russian government um, keep, keep coming up with new rules. So um, as one of the, the, the ex extracts you just showed indicate, it's not just a matter of, of locking the door and, uh, and leaving. There's a lot of different components that need to be considered, not least the, the people who've worked for the company for, for many years and are, of course, um, suffering because of the economic situation in Russia. Mm. So there are many different factors to consider. And, and as I said, the, the, the goalposts are constantly shifting. Ben, to the point of companies pulling out of Russia and the economic situation there, how much has this actually hurt Russia to have these corporates in Europe and the U.S. leave? I would say it's hurt them a lot. And, and, and obviously that's the objective of the sanctions. Um, it, the idea behind them is to, is to make life difficult for, for Russia to ensure that, um, that the money needed to fund this uh, terrible aggression against Ukraine is is um, is cut off at source. Um, so yeah, it's difficult for for European businesses, and they they recognise that, they understand it, and we as a as an international chamber organisation, our usual instinct is is to oppose sanctions. But on this occasion, we of course fully recognise the need because of the the unprecedented scale of of the the actions taken by the Russian state. So companies are sure. ready to, 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 to bite the bullet. Well, Ben, but, you say a, you, say you oppose sanctions. That, if I can jump in here, you say you oppose sanctions, but a lot of this has been self-sanctioning. Should it go further than self-sanctioning and actually be something that governments are mandating? Well, in, in, in many respects, governments are mandating this because, um, because by making the Russian economy um, such a, a difficult environment to, to, to succeed in commercially, um, it's no longer viable for some companies to, to, to continue operating in, in Russia. Um, we've just had the sixth uh, set of sanctions come out from, from the EU, which um, are making every, every time these sanctions are updated, it's becoming harder and harder to do business. Um, but as I said, actually, for, for European companies that are active in Russia, we need to help them find an orderly way of leaving to comply with these um, very stringent um, rules that are being imposed by the Russian state, making it what does a criminal that help look like, then? to comply with sanctions. Excuse me? What does that help look like? You say they need help. What would that be in the form of? Advice. They need advice. They need, um, they need to be told what's happening when, um, because the, the, the Russian parliament and the Russian state are constantly um, updating their, their bills. Um, they need to be told what they need to comply with and when they need to comply with it and how they need to comply with it. And that's where chambers can, can help. 
Um, I don't think we're talking about financial support here, but it's really just guidance on what they need to comply with and how. Is there any way back in for these companies, Ben, if and when this war does end? Well, we need to we need to work on that. We need to hope so. At the moment, of course, that in the short term, the objective is to is to um, to make it um, is to is to be punitive towards the Russian economy. So, in the short term, there's no way back. I don't think because there's no need to go back. There's no there's no um, commercial argument to re-entering the Russian market at the moment. But we would be cautious about fully closing the doors, fully closing the dialogue, because at some point, hopefully in the near future, this war will be over. And, and we do need to make sure that even if the Russian state has gone rogue, the whole economy doesn't go rogue and that it becomes um, an economy with which European companies can work effectively mm. and on, in a rules-based manner in the future. Ben, afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. Ben Butters, CEO of Eurochambre. Coming up, we take a look at how the war in Ukraine is hitting global food inflation. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. around 25 million tons of wheat uh, right now in Ukraine stuck in the silos uh, and unable to be moved. Uh, and there are discussions and uh, uh, coordination trying to happen to uh, send it by land. But uh, it will be, A, difficult. Uh, I believe uh, it can't be at the volumes that are needed. World Bank Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnership, Mari Elka Panjetsu, there on the impact of the war in Ukraine and on wheat exports from the country. Now, the UN's FAO Food Price Index has fallen 0.6% in May from April. That marks the second consecutive monthly decline. But to be sure, this is still well above its value in the corresponding month last year. The drop in May was also led by a decline in vegetable oil and dairy prices, while the sugar price index also fell to a lesser extent. Extent. Meanwhile, cereal and meat price indices increase led by wheat. Joining us now is Michael Magdavitz, Senior Analyst for Agricultural Commodities Market Research at Rabobank. Michael, thanks for joining us this morning. And as this war takes shape a hundredth day, the obsession, the concern when it comes to commodities has been all about the Black Sea, all about the Bosphorus Strait. You write that we are overemphasizing, we are misdirecting by concentrating on this. Why? Well, good morning, Danny. Yeah, I think it is an uh, important point that the Black Sea has been stopped up and that Ukrainian goods cannot leave. Um, in recent days, the market has reacted to uh, the discussions between the UN and Russia about freeing up those goods, but we see it as highly unlikely at this stage um, that it is going to yield any tangible progress. And even if it does, much of the damage in terms of productivity in the Ukraine silos, um, and the goods, frankly, haven't flowed for over 100 days, is, is going to be felt in the market. So I believe it's a bit of a misdirection to, for the market to be focusing on this and not on other mm. practical measures. What should we be focusing on, Michael? Well, there's an enormous amount of food in the world that is being used for energy, particularly in the United States and in Europe, uh, for biodiesel, which is effectively vegetable oil, high-quality food ingredient or ethanol, that's corn, that more than makes up for the shortfall uh, in the Ukraine. So if some of that were freed up, uh, you would see quite a dramatic increase in availability for food when right now there's very little of, uh, of that. Well, we talk about usually the cure for high prices be being high prices. You're describing a different scenario where the economic incentives perhaps are not aligned. How likely is that, that we stop using this biodiesel and redirect that towards food production? Well, I don't think it's very likely at all because the countries that produce surpluses of vegetable oil aren't seeing the highest inflation um, and they have constituencies which, of course, uh, are less impacted than perhaps importing countries. But it's nonetheless an important uh, thing to consider because, mm. you know, inflation is ubiquitous and we are seeing uh, inflation rising quite quickly, even in developed countries that have surplus goods. That inflation, Michael, coupled with the high food prices, we've seen unrest, for example, in Sri Lanka. 
are we underestimating the risk that we see more widespread unrest? Oh, there's absolutely the risk that uh, hunger is going to increase. In fact, I mean, I could just point at what uh, hedge funds have been doing, funds have been doing in the last couple of weeks. We've seen wholesale liquidation um, across, particularly if you look at corn, uh, vegetable oil as well. I think there's a view that demand is going to solve inflation rather than supply. And that has, uh, of course, that means hunger is going to, to, to solve the issue. When you have hunger, hmm. that leads to instability. In countries where this isn't an issue, the more developed countries, Michael, does there need to be demand rationing? Well, yes. Uh, there, I mean, even if you look at your shelves um, at Trader Joe's or in New York, or if you're looking in Tesco's here, you're not going to see sun oil on the shelves. So there already is uh, supply scarcity across a number of goods, but it'll be exacerbated if you're an importing country of these goods, um, and you'll see you know double-digit inflation rather than perhaps single-digit inflation, and even scarcity. Michael. I want to jump in because one last question before I let you go. We've seen the likes of India, for example, limit some of their agricultural exports. How big of a risk is this idea of resource nationalism? And, and quickly here, Michael. Sure. Protectionism is a huge risk. We've seen it not only um, in India, but Argentina. And it's, it's a big danger because it can exacerbate the issues that we're seeing in terms of uh, trade flow d dynamics and supply issues. But I'm certainly so concerned. What then what, what then is the biggest pain point that perhaps has yet to be appreciated or priced in? Well, uh, you know, if we have a weather issue, um, we're already very low supplied in exporting nations. With Ukraine out, we've effectively taken a notch out of our belts and everybody's tightening that belt. But if there's another country that loses supply capacity or shuts off with protectionism, the world will be really, really at risk of uh, starvation. Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a really sort of grim picture you're painting, Michael. I mean, I just want to leave on, on one note, sort of what is the place that is likely that can make up for this to, to avoid the outcome which you're describing? And we have uh, about a minute left here, Michael. Sure. Well, if the Ukraine opens up, that would be a huge uh, benefit to the world. I think without the Ukraine, you'll see pickups in Europe, the United States, and South America. Um, of course, they won't offset that capacity, but they will help bridge the gap. And I think unequivocally, you are going to see demand uh, rationing across a number of key commodities. That's just uh, the reality of the status quo. But if Ukraine can open up, or if we see reductions of food for energy in the United States or in Europe, that would free up a lot of capacity um, to help assuage high prices. Michael, thank you very much. Michael Magdavit, Senior Analyst for Agricultural Commodities Market Research at Rabobank. Now that's it for our special program on the first 100 days of the war in Ukraine. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour with Matt, Kaylee, and Anna. This is Bloomberg. Inflation is, is not transitory. It is probably with us for a number of years. I don't think we're going into recession in the next 12 months. It's the 12 months after that that I'm worried about. No matter how you slice it, well, uh, I think you are seeing a, a very tight labor market. Across the board from daily to Bullard, you're hearing the need for tighter policy. The more of these, these, these numbers that we get that show that the economy is slowing but not cratering, that's going to be taking pressure off the Fed. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Friday, June 3rd. Our top stories today. Is the U.S. labor market cooling down? Jobs data is due today. Meanwhile, a report says Elon Musk has a bad feeling about the economy and wants to cut 10% of Tesla staff. President Biden pleads with Congress to impose limits on assault weapons. The president says responsible gun owners shouldn't worry that their rights will be curtailed. And 100 days of the war in Ukraine. The UK's defence ministry says that Russia now has the momentum after Moscow's initial plan failed. 
Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lyons up early, of course, in New York. And Kaylee, we're without some volume out of Asia, without some volume here in Europe as well, but lots to talk about when it comes to the jobs market. Yeah, absolutely. We're all awaiting that data in about three and a half hours time here in the U.S. But as you say, Anna, it has been a lighter day so far, at least ahead of U.S. trading, because none of us are on holiday today. They were on holiday, though, in China and Hong Kong. That is the reason that those markets weren't open. So when we see that Asian markets broadly were higher, we have to keep that in mind with the four tenths of a percent move for the MSCI Asia Pacific Index. Now, Japan was open for trading and really outperformed uh, the Nikkei 225 up about 1.3 percent. Part of that may have to do with what was a fractionally weaker Japanese yen, weaker against the dollar by about a tenth of one percent. We are trading just just underneath that psychologically important 130 handle. But really in Asian foreign exchange, it is the South Korean won that is outperforming stronger against the dollar by about three quarters of 1%. We're trading around 1,242 or so. And that is after stronger than expected inflation data. CPI coming in at 5.4% for the month of May. That is solidifying bets on more aggressive rate hiking uh, coming out of South Korea. And that is what is strengthening the currency today, Matt. All right, very interesting stuff. Meanwhile, after an almost 2% rally on the S&P 500 yesterday, we see futures down just a little bit today, uh, about three tenths of 1%. The 10 year yield continues to rise, although at 291.13, I'm gonna say it's exactly where it was when we did this yesterday at 5 a.m. NYMEX crude is off, uh, but down to 115.94, so it's down to a level that's higher than the level we saw yesterday. There've been a lot of moves um, up and down amidst this uh, OPEC meeting, and finally, after we got the decision, we're seeing a little bit of pressure taken out. Bitcoin, very little change. Change. You can see 30,387. So it looks like um, indeed the market is waiting for that non farm payrolls number, Anna, and then we could see some action. Let's have a look at where we are in Europe because we're also waiting for that payrolls data and then maybe we see some action, Matt. But we do have, of course, the London market is closed, so ignore that red, uh, that red patch. Actually, we are not trading here in London today. Generally, then, we are making modest gains across European equity markets. It's a mixed bag, though. The sector's moving higher. Not necessarily a lot of uh, narrative and conviction behind them. We see healthcare stocks doing well. Chemicals, though, also doing well. Uh, volumes are low, down 60% compared to an average day for Europe as a whole because London is out, but also down 30% or so 40% almost on German markets. So even with London out, it takes out volumes in other parts of Europe as well. So that's the picture across the map, across the European continent. Uh, let's have a quick look at uh, oil. We just heard uh, Matt talking about the WTI price, 116 down 7 tenths of 1% after we heard from uh, OPEC increasing the pace at which they are increasing that output, but not overwhelming the market, underwhelming the market, it would seem. And we are a little bit, uh, well, pausing for thought really on oil prices versus the size of recent moves. For Essia, this is a car parts supplier based in France. They recently did a, a deal to buy the German uh, rival Heller. As a result, they're doing some refinancing today. Equity issuance, the stock down by 4.4% in response. Uh, Ap uh, Aparam, this is a, a business that's in focus today. We're seeing consolidation being talked about within the steel sector. So we have Aparam SA very much in the mix of this. Uh, it seems that uh, there are uh, businesses that are talking about mergers, a Luxembourg-based business that was spun out of ArcelorMittal, uh, that company talking to Spanish, its Spanish rival about whether to do a deal. So we'll watch for tie-ups there in that space. And CRH, this one not moving all that much, but I had to put it in because CRH is an Irish building supplying uh, business and they are buying a company, an outdoor fencing business based in Ohio. Kaylee, I am told I'm supposed to say the great state of Ohio, <laughs> but that feels unnecessarily um, uh, uh, partial, if you like, torn as I am between Ohio and Virginia. Well, Virginia is a commonwealth, so maybe we can call Ohio the great state and Virginia the great commonwealth. And both Matt and I will be happy, Anna. All right, now let's get back to what is ahead in this Friday. And of course, as we mentioned, it has been 100 days since Russia's initial incursion into Ukraine with no end in sight to the war. Then later on, we'll get more comments from Fed Chair Lael Brainerd at an event in Washington hosted by the Urban Institute. I am sure she will be giving her instant reaction to the U.S. jobs report, which, as we've said, is coming out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. Now let's get more on that with Bloomberg's Danny Berger, who has a look at what we should be expecting. Danny, how strong a number are we looking at today? 
Look, it is decently strong. 323,000 is the expectation of economists surveyed. Um, so yes, strong, but it would be one of the lowest shares in the past year. You get unemployment. That's expected to come in at 3.5%. Uh, that would be the lowest figure of the post-pandemic era. And at the same time, hourly earnings higher by about four-tenths of 1% month after month. Now, in terms of how the market is anticipating and potentially reacting to this, the ADP figures were fascinating yesterday surprisingly weak. Of course, ADP does a very bad job of foreshadowing non-farm pay rules, but it just showed that at least when it comes to equity markets, they're really happy to embrace any employment figures, which seem to suggest that the Fed can't be as aggressive as they want to be. So perhaps a little bit of a, a foreshadowing of one potential market reaction mm. to the jobs number, but perhaps they should take a little heed. I mean, Matt, we heard from Leo Brainard yesterday yep. saying, you know, a pause, it's unlikely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the markets are paying very close attention to that as well as the jobs number. And speaking of jobs, we had um, a warning in a sense from Elon Musk and job cuts at Tesla. Yeah, I mean, what a day to choose to announce jobs cut on jobs day of all of all days. Uh, so this is a Reuters report and he sent an email apparently saying that he was um, had super bad feelings about the economy. I think that was the exact words he said, very academic. Um, and because of that, he's pausing all hire, hiring and wants to cut about 10% of the workforce. That would be about 10,000 employees. And I have to say, you know, just to nerd out a little bit, this is interesting in the context of Jobs Day because if the Fed is able to tighten financial conditions, if there is concern about the economy, this is one way where it would show up in the real economy. And of course, um, we've heard from other tech companies talking about freezing uh, or cutting back on, employ on employees, uh, Netflix, Twitter. So, you know, Tesla, not necessarily just a one-off, Anna. Mm, yeah, really interesting comments from uh, Elon Musk, given we know that he's had issue with the work practices yeah. that some of his staff want to adopt of late, the whole work from home return to office debate. Uh, we will continue to watch those developments. Danny, thank you. Bloomberg's Danny Berger with us on jobs broadly. Now, President Biden is pleading with Congress to toughen gun laws following a number of mass killings. He spoke at the White House yesterday. We need to ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines. And if we can't ban assault weapons, then we should raise the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. Strengthen background checks, enact safe storage law and red flag laws. Repeal the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability. Address the mental health crisis, deepening the trauma of gun violence and as a consequence of that violence. The U.S. president calling to raise the age to buy assault weapons and high-capacity magazines from 18 to 21, a measure the New York legislature approved yesterday. Emily Wilkins, a Bloomberg government reporter, joins us from D.C. for more. So we've seen New York perhaps taking some action here, Emily. What more broadly can we expect? Well, I think that if you listen to what President Biden said, he really kind of hits the nail on the head, that there are certain things that there is still not the ability for this Congress to do, like passing a ban on assault weapons. But there is uh, some action on moving that age from 18 to 21 to buy some of these semi-assault weapons. As you mentioned, that's something New York has done. That's something we've also seen movement in the House on. We saw House lawmakers advance a bill uh, just last night that would go ahead and do that, as well as several other message um other provisions dealing with gun storage, uh, dealing with red flag laws, um, which would basically make sure that those who have violent tendencies don't have access to firearms and weapons. But really the action here to watch is in the Senate. There is where you have a bipartisan group of senators that are working on trying to figure out legislation. Those talks have been mostly held remote because lawmakers weren't in town this past week, but they expect those discussions to continue when they are back in town. And you heard Republican uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell say that he is hopeful and optimistic that there can be some sort of compromise on uh, passing gun control measures. And, and President Biden um, wants to do something on guns. At the same time, he's going to go to Saudi Arabia and meet uh, most likely with the leader, right, um, um, MBS, even as he holds him responsible for the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. 
Yeah, this is a very interesting dynamic here because you did see Biden, when he was a candidate, say that he was going to make sure that Saudi Arabia paid for what it did with Jamal Khashoggi, that they were going to be the, pri the prize that they were. But this really shows that the U.S. does need to have that relationship with Saudi Arabia, uh, with MBS at this point. I mean, in part because of Russia and Ukraine and the oil crisis, and just part because of what is going on with the region. I mean, you heard Secretary of State Anthony Blinken uh, sort of note that uh, Israel and Saudi wants the U.S. and Saudi Arabia to have a good relationship, as well as what's going on with Iran, that the U.S. sees Saudi Arabia as a key ally in making sure that that country's influence doesn't expand to the rest of the region. So you are going to, we are expecting to see that meeting come in late July on a previously scheduled trip where Biden's also going to be meeting with leaders in Israel as well as European nations. Emily, thank you very much. Something of the real politique about it. Emily uh, Wilkins of Bloomberg Government in Washington. Now, the European Union finally overcame Hungarian objections to approve the bloc's six sanctions package against Moscow just as we enter the 100th day of the war in Ukraine. For more, we go to our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who's in Brussels. Maria, what was in this six package? We talk a lot about oil, of course, and they managed to overcome objections there, it seems, in the end. Yes, and Anna, it's been a month in the making. Remember, it was at the start of May where the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said the European Union would ban Russian oil into the EU. Now, finally, there is a political deal, but also a technical uh, deal behind it. We know there is a partial oil ban. Essentially, it makes a separation between seaborne oil and pipeline oil. That will get an exemption. And overall, the European Union looks to reduce the amount of oil they buy from Russia by 90% by the end of this this year. So that is the end of 2022. Now, this is all coming also a day after President Zelensky painted a very grim picture of the situation now in Ukraine. He says that 20 percent of Ukraine's territory is now controlled by Russia or Russian-backed separatists. He also talks about on a bad day, uh, Ukraine losing perhaps units of 60 to 100 uh, soldiers. Again, repeating, in order to stay competitive in the war, the country needs uh, more weapons. And on top of this, uh, Anna, the narrative the momentum over the past week has really shifted uh, in favor of Russia. And it's not just about the 20 percent they control, but overall is the geography of the territories Russia controls now. Hubs that are very industrial, cities like Zverdonetsk, that's very industrial too, but also the access uh, to the sea. For the Ukrainians, this is now a very tricky stage of the war. All right, 100 days and still counting. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Now let's get back to the markets and take a look at some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S. One of them is the software company Okta. It is actually one of the biggest outperformers in the early trade. It's up about 16% after its results after the bell yesterday. It uh, raised its forecast for the full year. Analysts really, really positive on the numbers. Investors seem to be as well this morning. Investors also seem to be positive on one company in particular, and that would be Kohl's, which of course is a retailer. It was reported overnight that it has received multiple offers uh, to purchase Kohl's, one of them at $60 a share, the other in the mid-50s range. That stock is trading at around $43.48 a share this morning, up about 5.5%. And one more stock that is moving higher is Lululemon. It too reported after the bell yesterday. It's working through those supply chain issues to meet still strong consumer demand for athleisure. I guess there's still enough people working from home that don't really want to wear, you know, jeans and real pants. They'd rather wear Lululemon leggings. So that uh, company raising its forecast for the full year shares a little bit higher in early hours as a result of about 1.3%, Anna. Who are those people, Kaylee? I don't know any <laughs> of them. Right, coming up on this program, we will get back to the markets conversation. Matteo Savary joins us, Chief Strategist at BCA Research. Plus, we will talk to Holger Schmieding, Chief Economist at Berenberg. Really interesting to get his take on inflation. And speaking of inflation, elevated inflation for years. We caught up with the BlackRock CEO, Larry Fink, and discussed the Fed's role in taming prices. I don't believe the Federal Reserve has the policy or the tools to do much with it right now. And, I, and I'm personally not blaming the Federal Reserve for where, they, where we are right now. But I believe most of the problems we're living with today are more policy generated and supply generated. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Anna Edwards 
in London. And we are awaiting the non-farm payrolls number. It's the granddaddy of economic statistics coming once a month. I want to encourage those of you who are sitting in front of a Bloomberg or who will be in front of a Bloomberg before the number comes out to participate in the Whisper Number competition. WHIS Go is how you call this up on your Bloomberg terminal. And it's important because winning matters. So if you put in your estimate, you can beat other people um, who are playing. And that is uh, what makes life worth living. Joining us now is Tatiana Derry of Bloomberg Markets Live. Um, Tatiana, right now we're looking for, um, I think the official estimate is 320,000. The whisper number is a little bit weaker at 301. What do markets need to see today? Yes, uh, Matt, like you said, uh, you know, economists are broadly expecting uh, payrolls growth to moderate. So if it comes in line with expectations, I think markets may just look through it, but it, it disappoints really big. If we get a really low number, I think this is where we could see a big rally in rates and also stocks. And I think uh, traders have already positioned for that, right? If you look at the stock reaction yesterday, we got a big rally there. After that, weaker than expected ADP reports. Now, we know there is not a tremendous correlation between the two. But nonetheless, I think the market's expectation here that is that we're going to see a disappointment. Mm, I'll be back to that. Bad news is good news for risk assets story then, Tatiana, one to watch. What about what we've heard about oil? I, I talked to a couple of analysts yesterday about oil and the increase, the bringing forward of those increases at the margin that we saw from OPEC+. Plus. Uh, the general view seemed to be that the market was pretty underwhelmed by what had been pledged. What did you make of it? Exactly. We got that big rally despite a bigger than expected uh, increase from OPEC+. Plus. And like you said there, you know, most experts, uh, it appears to be a consensus. They say it's not going to materially change anything for this market. And later in the session, we also got crude inventories here in the U.S. And we saw a drop twice bigger than expected last, last week. So that still points, you know, to a tight supply out there. And that's at a time when China is coming off uh, their uh, uh, lockdowns and as well as uh, the biggest world's biggest economy here in the U.S. hitting the roads for the biggest travel season. So all in all, uh, everyone's still looking uh, for a tighter market here going forward, at least in the, in the near term. Uh, I think the next focus will be that visit uh, by President Biden or potential visit by President Biden to Saudi Arabia. That may cause uh, a turnaround here. But for now, I think we're, we're in the range for oil prices. Okay, so if oil prices stay elevated, that obviously feeds into inflation. The Fed is considering the inflation picture and whether or not it's going to be able to pause in September. We've heard a bit of conflicting uh, chatter around that from different Fed speakers, Tatiana, and the credit market has reacted to that. Yes, exactly. Credits are, are credit is just looking to stocks, uh, you know, and has been uh, really reacting in similar uh, ways there. And, and now that we see sort of last week, there was this idea of a Fed pause and, you know, risk assets rallied, stocks a high yield and even uh, the more duration sensitive like uh, investment grade credit also rallied. And this week we're seeing some pushback on that idea, not least uh, yesterday from uh, Fed uh, Vice Chair Brainerd also saying that it's too primitive to talk about a pause. So as markets rethink that September move, uh, I think we could see sort of a reversal of the recent uh, trends that we've seen. And for credit, that means that this recent brief rally we saw the last uh, at the end of May uh, could have run its course here. Tatiana, thanks so much. Tatiana Zaria joining us there from the Bloomberg Markets Live team. And for more market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go, that is the function to use on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Is the U.S. labor market cooling down? Jobs data is due later today. Meanwhile, a report says Elon Musk has a bad feeling about the economy and wants to cut 10% of Tesla staff. That could mean almost 10,000 jobs lost worldwide. President Biden pleads with Congress to impose limits on assault weapons. The president says responsible gun owners shouldn't worry that their rights will be curtailed. He wants a ban on assault weapons, but acknowledges that Congress is unlikely to go along. And 100 days of war in Ukraine. The UK's defense ministry says that Russia now has the momentum after Moscow's initial plan failed. The Donbass region is seen as the new focus. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And, and Matt, uh, European equity markets uh, broadly positive, of course, on reduced volume. And the same was true with Asia. 
Yes, and of course, uh, many traders are going to sit on their hands until they get this non-farm payrolls number out at 830. But it does look like the labor market might be slowing down here in the U.S. Bob Burgess uh, has a great piece on Bloomberg Opinion about that. Tom Porcelli uh, agrees, and it looks like 10 percent is the number um, right now for Silicon Valley companies to be cutting in terms of jobs. S&P futures are down right now about four tenths of one percent. Of course, we were up on the cash trade yesterday, almost two percent. So it turned out to be a strong day in the cash trade yesterday. The 10 year yield rising um, very little, but nonetheless, investors are letting go of some of that paper. Right now, 291.13 is the level on the 10-year yield, and NYMEX crude coming, coming down after the OPEC decision um, to boost production. 115.83 is the level there, so still not cheap for TI. Um, and Bitcoin um, right now, very little change, but hovering around, as usual, the 30,000 level right now, 30,184. Kaylee, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, of course, the one stock we're really paying attention to this morning is Tesla for the very reason that Anna mentioned. Elon Musk reportedly in an email to Tesla executive saying, I'm super concerned about the economy. He has a super bad feeling, I believe is the direct quote, and therefore he wants to freeze all hiring globally and cut 10% of Tesla's workforce. That is taking a bit of uh, air out of the stock as well. This morning. It's down about 3.4% before the bell, and you're seeing some other EV makers being dragged down along with it. Rivian and Lucid each down a little more than 1%. Another stock that is moving lower, and this is on a downgrade from over at Piper Sandler, is Micron, the chip maker. The analyst over there putting a $70 price target on the stock. It's trading around $72.52 this morning. Of course, it's already down about 19% year to date. It's lower by another 4% or so before the bell today, Anna. Well, we don't have a super bad feeling about European stocks, Kaylee, but maybe the feeling is getting worse. We're certainly off our earlier highs of the session. Low volumes, of course, with the London market closed, but we are eking out a gain of one cent of a percent, but being weighed down perhaps by uh, those US futures, which do look, uh, do look negative now. Foresia also in focus. This is a parts maker, an equity issuance from this French uh, auto parts maker. They're trying to refinance a deal they've already done for Heller, one of their German rivals. Aparam, this is also about M&A, interestingly, and Aparam is... Uh, uh, operates in the steel space. It was sp uh, spun out of ArcelorMittal, and now they're interested in talking to, at least, their Spanish rival, Serenox, and see if they can do a deal there. So the uh, the uh, potential acquirer actually moving higher today. Uh, Serenox actually still suspended in uh, in Spain. CRH is on the move just slightly, and more M&A there. It seems that we are talking a bit about M&A. Uh, they're doing a deal for around 1.9 billion US dollars to buy an outdoor uh, outdoor. Uh, uh, a furniture manufacturer over in the United States. A fence maker, that's the word I was looking for, Kaylee. Not just the United States, Anna, the great state of Ohio, as Matt Miller oh, would yes. say. <laughs> All right, now let's get back to these markets. Joining us is Matthew Savary, chief strategist at BCA Research. Of course, Matthew, it's jobs day. Is this going to be a classic case of good news is bad news and that it means the Fed can go ahead and be aggressive with its tightening and bad news is good news because maybe it means it gives them pause? Uh, yeah, that's absolutely our anticipation. Um, the big worry in the market in recent weeks has been uh, inflation and the, the potential of the Fed to actually essentially murder the business cycle uh, if inflation remains elevated. So if we do get a bit of a cool off in job numbers, uh, as is anticipated to some degree, um, the stock market is likely to uh, like that uh, very much. OK, so we get very quickly to that sort of second derivative where bad news then becomes good news, Mathieu. Uh, what, is the, what is the outlook for the second half of the year then? If you make the assumption that we are seeing a bit of a slowing, a bit of a turning in the US labour market story, is that, is that unashamedly negative or this market maybe is too tight and this could be a, a, a good thing at the margin? Uh, when it comes to the labor market itself, yes, it would be a good thing at the margin. The, the, the labor market is too tight. It is generating inflationary pressure and it is inviting the Fed to uh, tighten uh, policy substantially and considering um, the valuation environment. Uh, yes, stocks are cheaper than they were a few months ago, but uh, they are still not priced in for uh, very, very high rates uh, that would be forced upon the US economy if indeed the labor market did not cool off. So uh, a cool off in the labor market would be a good thing um, in this context. 
Um, what about coming back into Europe then and the European context? What about the ECB, Mathieu? Because we're going to hear from the ECB shortly. Uh, Bloomberg survey of economists showed that 20, 25 basis point hike expected in the summer, 25 again in September, uh, as if maybe all of those hawkish calls are going to be ignored and we're not going to see a 50 basis points move at least over that time period. What's your expectation? Yeah, I do not expect a 50 basis point uh, hike in uh, Europe uh, either. At the end of the day, the ECB uh, works with a consensus. So yes, some of the most hawkish members of the, on the Council uh, are willing to push interest rates up by 50 basis points, but uh, it's far off where the median uh, voter uh, stands right now uh, on the Council. So it's highly unlikely. Moreover, uh, the Euro European economy has shown a tremendous amount of uh, weakness. Uh, we've seen a big deceleration in economic activity. Uh, lots of consumption data has been uh, weakening significantly, uh, especially in volume term. And uh, uh, there are signs that uh, European inflation uh, might peak in the summer. So that uh, it makes it very unlikely that the ECB will increase rates by 50 basis points. I'm actually taking the under on the ESTR curve pricing right now. Is there any possibility that we see um, a, a recession and then even more fiscal spending, even though a lot of people might think that's what led to inflation. It seems to be the only hope for um, Europe, especially with a central bank that has a kind of shadow mandate to maintain strength of the union. Yeah, I mean, a recession is possible uh, in this year for the Eurozone. Uh, it would become much more likely if, uh, in response to the oil embargo or to the oil uh, um, ban uh, announced earlier this week, Russia decided to suddenly uh, cut off its uh, shipment of natural gas uh, to the European Union. Um, in all cases, we are likely to see uh, more fiscal stimulus coming out of the uh, European Union and the Eurozone in particular. Uh, at the end of the day, Europe has shown some weakness. There is also a need to um, increase the uh, domestic investment to move away from the dependency on Russian energy. There is a willingness to increase military spending to protect uh, the continent against uh, potential uh, attacks from uh, Russia, or just generally speaking, to deal with the growing threat from Russia. So in this context, yes, we are anticipating more fiscal stimulus uh, on a go-forward basis. And that's very important because that's the key to avoid the kind of low growth environment that plagued the Eurozone last decade. Mathieu, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Mathieu Savary of BCA Research. Coming up on the program, Holger Schmieding, Chief Economist at Berenberg. How much weakness does he see in the US labor market, or does it remain really hot? Uh, we will talk to Holger about that and the role of the Fed, how much the Fed would be prepared to weaken that labor market. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Chevron Chairman and CEO Mike Worth. That's at 10.30 a.m. in New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lyons over in New York. Now, a moderation in the labor market may be reflected in today's U.S. jobs report. Employers probably, this is the forecast, added about 320,000 jobs in the month of May. Robust, but still the smallest increase in a year. The jobs report is out at 8.30 a.m. New York time. Holger Schmieding, chief economist at Berenberg, joins us now for more on what to expect. Um, Holger, give us your thoughts on what you're expecting to see the number itself and what the Fed's view is of this rate of unemployment that we see as low as it is in the United States right now. They, one of their dual mandates is, of course, maximum sustainable employment. Are they able to let unemployment rise to take the heat out of the system? Well, maximum sustainable employment and inclusive employment, that's indeed a lofty goal. That is something that's always difficult to achieve. As to the number today, our forecast is roughly in line with the number that you've given. But we will be looking actually not just at the headline payrolls number. We will we'll be looking much more closely 
at the inflation, wage inflation data, at average hourly earnings, where we do hope to see some moderation from the 5.5% rate of the previous month. And if so, that would be good news. As to the Fed, the Fed has allowed the U.S. economy to run far too hot last year. It now has the job of slowing it down without tipping it into recession. So my guess is some rise in unemployment, which we are unlikely to see now, but which we may see later this year, some rise in unemployment in the unemployment yeah. rate would be fine for the Fed. Say, if unemployment goes from 3.5 to 4%, the Fed would probably say that's what we need to achieve. But if unemployment were to go much beyond that in the U.S., then the Fed would probably not want to see that. They certainly do not want a U.S. recession. Holger, we've had a couple of data points over this week that on the surface looked fantastic. I'm thinking about the uh, conference board consumer confidence number and um, the ISM factory gauge, both beating expectations by a, a long way. But if you look at the jobs portions of these numbers, um, they actually looked pretty bad. For example, the ISM, um, the jobs portion of, uh, of that index fell below 50. And if you look at um, the conference board, the difference between those saying jobs were plentiful versus those saying jobs were hard to get uh, capped its biggest two-month slide since the great financial recession. Are we starting to see, are we, have we reached a turning point here? Yes, we probably have reached a turning point in the labor market. Of course, it's always risky to say that with the monthly report just ahead. But there are now a number of signs that the labor market is at what you could call an inflection point. That is, the labor market has been extremely tight. And this tightness may have peaked over the last few months. So as far as we can say now, this is pretty much exactly what the Fed would like to see, economic growth that continues with labor market pressures easing a bit and hence hopefully wage pressures easing a bit and hence hopefully um, inflation pressures easing a bit going forward. But this is just the start of the trend. Whether or not the Fed will actually achieve the often somewhat elusive soft landing that I described initially with a modest rise in unemployment later this year and early next year remains a big question. Well, talking of what the Fed can realistically achieve, Holger, if we're talking about a U.S. consumer that still has great confidence in their ability to get a job if they want one, even as their wages are no longer really keeping pace with inflation, they haven't been for some time, savings rates are being drawn down. Instead, the consumer is still spending. They're just levering up. They're putting more on credit cards. So how difficult is the job going to be for the Federal Reserve to actually rein in demand if we're seeing sentiment deteriorate and a consumer still willing to shell out cash? at least by borrowing? Well, so far, fortunately, it is in aggregate not re really borrowing by the U.S. consumer that's powering the, um, the ongoing, if probably somewhat moderating, economic upswing. It, the better way to describe it for many is that they are dipping into the excess savings which they built up during the pandemic. And this is a process that can last for a while. But indeed, this soft landing is something difficult to achieve. As monetary policy works, standard thing with a lag, we will only know to some extent after the fact whether or not the Fed has managed to slow down the economy without tipping it into recession. It looks to me they probably will manage to do so, but it remains a tough job. We have a 40% risk of a shallow U.S. recession early next year in response to what the Fed is now set to do over the next few months, 50 basis points, 50 basis points, mm -hmm. and probably another 50 basis points hike in September. Where do you put the prospects of a pause come the fall? Um, for September, highly unlikely, possible but highly unlikely. We would have to see a significant turn in the data, which we currently do not see. But after September, that is quite possible that the, it's more possible that the Fed then pauses to just wait and see what the economy is doing in response to its current and impending actions. 
All right, Holger Schmieding of Berenberg, thank you so much for joining us on this Jobs Friday. Have a great weekend. Now, while we're discussing jobs, in the past few months, we've seen a number of tech companies from startups to giants like Tesla just today announcing hiring freezes or job cuts. And you can now add the crypto business run by billionaire brothers Cameron and Tyler Winker Winklevoss, the Winklevi twins, to the list. <laughs> Gemini Trust is making its first ever job cut, slashing 10% of its staff as trading across the industry plunges. In a memo seen by Bloomberg News, the brothers blamed the job cuts on the crypto winter, saying, quote, this has been all further compounded by the ma current macroeconomic and geopolitical turmoil. We are not alone. And Matt, of course, they are not alone. We've seen jobs uh, cut reports from Tesla just this morning, and we know that a lot of crypto firms are now struggling. Yeah, and uh, Elon Musk warning of a super bad feeling that he has about the economy. Uh, as Holger Schmieding just told us, we may have reached a turning point in terms of labor. Again, I refer um, Bloomberg users to the Bob Burgess column on OPI mm. and Go because it does look, if you if you dig into the details, like we may have reached uh, um, an inflection point, and I guess we're going to learn a lot more about that at 8.30 a.m. this yeah. morning. Absolutely. Jobs very much in focus. Back on the crypto theme, though, interesting to see overnight, though, whilst there are, there are quiet places around the globe in terms of public holidays, but Japan very busy. And Japan actually legislating to protect investors who hold money in stable coins, one of the first major economies to do that, which, uh, as we watch how regulators deal with crypto, sounds interesting. Yeah, regulators here in the U.S. still not exactly sure how to figure out the stablecoin question, Anna. We've seen a lot of talk about it. The question is what action ultimately will we actually see? Of course, that's something we continue to discuss on Matt and I's program, Bloomberg Crypto. That's every Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time. The weekly show covers the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Uh, Tom Keen joins us right now, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, to talk about um, what's on his program and to give us his single best chart. Tom, what have you got? Jobs Day today. We'll dive into that here across all of the hours. That, uh, we do a very important. Some people hoping for a soft jobs report. But on the theme here with Anna Edwards of what's going on in London this is a chart that surprised me. This is a long-term chart, not of cable under the Atlantic Ocean, sterling, dollar, but euro sterling. It's very confusing. Ann Edwards is the only one I know that has this memorized. And the answer is the long-term 30-year depreciation of pound sterling versus the euro. And to get across Ooh. the 20 miles, Matt Miller folks swam this a couple of years ago from <laughs> South Foreign to Cape Grinez, but... The, I hope I pronounced that right, <laughs> Cape Greenez. Uh, I'm sure, but I'm it, sure. Somebody I, French I, will write in. And I, I don't think people right. are aware of this. House. The long-term no, depreciation I mean, the, of sterling. Yeah, well, the reduced influence globally, perhaps something to do with that. Let's get back to the U.S., though, Tom, sure. because I know that you are going to focus on the jobs report, and you've got a great lineup of guests to do that. A, a very good lineup of academics and people working in the trenches. Randall Krosner will join us from uh, the University of Chicago in the Booth School, the former Fed governor, all the way over to Ellen Zentner, Priya Misra on the yield space, and Jeffrey Rosenberg really looking forward to what happens big after this, which is that ECB meeting and then on to the Fed meeting. All right, Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, looking forward to those conversations and you breaking down the jobs numbers at 8.30 a.m. New York time. That certainly is what I'm watching today. Aside from just the numbers themselves, how is the market going to react to them? If we get a strong print, is that automatically bad news for risk assets because it means that the Fed is going to be gung-ho and being aggressive in their tightening? And maybe if the print's a little softer, it actually leads to a boost in risk sentiment, as we saw with the ADP report yesterday. Reminder, the numbers, 320,000. Mm. on payrolls, a tick down in the unemployment rate to 3.5%, uh, and, and hourly earnings expected to be up four-tenths of a percent month on month. That is what I am technically watching on a professional level <laughs> at work today, Matt. Got to say, though, after work today, I'm going to be gearing up to go to the movie theater and see the new Top Gun movie. Yeah, you know, you and me both. In fact, you and me and Anna, we are all <laughs> going to 
different theaters. I'll be at the Alamo in Yonkers to watch Top Gun um, tonight. And I I'm pretty pumped. I know that Tom uh, Keen says he, he can't sit through this. Look at that. Miles Teller getting out of a Ford Bronco. <laughs> I'm excited for that. I'm excited to see what bike um, Tom Cruise rides. You know, Maverick rode uh, uh, um, a Ninja 900 in the first film. I think he rides a Kawasaki H2 in this film. Uh, there's oh, the there vintage bike and the new bike. What great <laughs> video here. You so, see, only you, Matt Miller, can turn this into a conversation about bikes. This is unashamedly about, about planes. <laughs> True. Uh, what are they flying? Like, are they flying F-18s? F it was F-14s in the first one. That's right. And but they're not on the F-35 yet, so that'll be in the in Top Gun 3, I guess. In any case, I'm excited for the planes, but they're you know that's beyond. I'm never gonna be able to touch. You know, only Kaylee's dad can do that. You know, <laughs> uh, the motorcycles is like as the far as thing. I can go. Yeah. OK, well, I'm also excited. I'm glad you pointed out we were not going together. I was thinking, though, if I took <laughs> off fairly soon, I could join you in New York. If I? you had an F-18. We could, we could all watch it together, but I'm not sure my carbon footprint could take that. Uh, I'm going to be watching that later on. I'm also going to be spending a lot of time uh, celebrating the uh, Queen's Platinum Jubilee over the weekend. Uh, and, and a lot of people will be here in the UK, of course. There's a, a service taking place at St Paul's today. And then over the weekend, it looks as if it might rain, which obviously is a shame because a lot of people have street parties planned, eating a lot of cake, drinking a lot of... If you believe the grocers, Matt, we're going to be drinking a lot of champagne and drinking a lot of gin. And that's what the weekend will involve. <laughs> Nice. Sounds exciting. I'll join you in that as well. <laughs> okay, excellent. And so will we'll, Tom. We'll do that whilst watching Top Gun. Early edition uh, comes to a close, then surveillance is ahead. Tom, John, and Lisa are here with that program. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>